a part of a social activity. And that influences our research and our research questions. And obviously the institutions are part of influence our research questions and what we do. Oxford expects us to publish quite a lot. Um, and so if we don't publish, if we don't get research grants, then probably we won't be invited back to work there. They don't fire us, but they don't give us another job. Let's put it that way. So that influences my stress, my anxiety. What do I need to do next? Um, all of these things impact research. So research is not just about knowledge. It's about money, institutions, networks, brands, and how people come together, convening power. So this is another really important aspect of research that I want to emphasize, emphasize to you. Um, so when we think about research, um, as we know, Oxford created this AstraZeneca vaccine um, and it was supposedly 97% public funded. And um, they say that it took 88 million pounds of funding to develop that vaccine. And when it, they say that it's publicly funded, Troy, what does public funding mean? It means it goes from the tax money that goes through the government. So I'm also funding research through my taxes. And this is the way the US and European countries fund a lot of research. They take tax and they put it into uh, research councils or research funding and then people apply. Um, but imagine 88 million pounds is a huge sum of money to produce um, a vaccine. Obviously excellent results, wonderful to have a vaccine. We're very happy for this. Um, but it's, a, it's an issue where um, it drives the research that's being done. I read an article about um, this disease in Brazil. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. Zika. Zika disease is still around. It's still affecting people, but there's no money to develop any treatment or vaccine for Zika. So many people are suffering because there's no money to develop a research um, sort of uh, center or laboratory around Zika disease. So we see how the money influences the research we do. Um, and also, uh, publishing companies can be really big business like Elsevier, um, Taylor and Francis. They make a lot of money from academics publishing. So I don't get paid by the publishing company to publish my article, but they make a lot of money from my article. Isn't that strange? Sometimes publishing companies want me to pay 2,000 pounds or 3,000 pounds to publish. Should we pay to get published? That's another question that Troy will um, deal with later. So we can see all these things are influencing our questions, they're influencing how we behave, they're influencing how we act. So we cannot claim that we're just operating in a completely objective world, that we're operating free of all constraints. Our research is social, it's part of power dynamics, it's part of these institutions and institutional dynamics. Even the fact that I'm here teaching you is an interesting power dynamic, right? There aren't many Mongolians teaching us in the UK, so we have also these other bigger power dynamics that we can think about, which is unfortunate, um, but it's part of this reality of the academic world at this point. Um, so what else is research? So I mentioned research is a social activity. It's influenced by politics and social fads. It's enmeshed in these institutions that we can't escape. Um, it's reliant on external funding. So is it objective and universal, or is it limited and partial? That's a question you can think about later. Um, but something that I want to make you start thinking about because it helps us to think critically about what we're doing and why we're doing it and what the institutions um, are made of in, the, in those senses. Okay, now I'm going to go back to some pretty um, basic research design questions. So research design, these are the questions that we think about with research design. Research design asks questions like, what is knowledge? That's a very big question. What is knowledge? Um, what is data? Who, what counts as valid data or valid um, knowledge? How do we recognize what's valid data and not valid data? How do we know? Um, whose voices count in the um, production of knowledge? That's a really important and big ethical question that we've been asking a lot. Why, is, why do academics' knowledge count more than a herder's knowledge, for example? Herders know a lot, you know? They know the environment, they know how to do everything, but why is my knowledge more 
elevated or more important than their knowledge. So there's these power dynamics with knowledge. So whose voices count? Um, how is research practiced as an individual and within an institution? What are the assumptions that we make in our research? And that's an incredibly important question. What assumptions do we have um, behind our questions? Um, and what other theories and beliefs guide our research? These are all research design um, questions. So I really like this sort of illustration by Cresswell from 2019. And he emphasizes that all research designs must have these three elements. They have some philosophical worldview. They, take, they make a decision about what philosophical worldview you're going to be taking. Are you a positivist, a post-positivist? Do you believe in social construction? Do you believe in advocacy, participatory research? Those different designs are not mutually compatible. Sometimes they're quite different from each other. So if you think, what's my philosophical worldview? I'm gonna sit in this philosophical worldview and I'm gonna do research. So with my personal research, I believe it's important to take a political stance sometimes. Like, um, you know, I'm not going to say, oh, let the mining companies keep taking over all the land in Mongolia and, you know, evict herders. I'm gonna say eviction of herders is not good. And I'm going to stand behind that belief. So I'm doing advocacy with my research. That doesn't mean that I can't also be objective, but I'm not necessarily taking a neutral point of view. Um, other people may disagree with me. They may say, no, 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 no. You have to always be neutral. This is the result. Just let other people decide what to do with that result. So there's different ideas about philosophical worldviews. Okay, secondly, research design should have, um, Cresswell calls it a selected strategy of inquiry, um, but I might call it just a methodology, which is different than data collection methods. It's a bigger approach, like a, how am I gonna go about doing this project? Is it an ethnography? Is it an experiment? Is it mixed methods? So if I say ethnography, within ethnography, there's many different data collection methods. So ethnography is just the strategy of inquiry, my wider methodological approach. Um, or if I'm doing an experiment, that's like, okay, I'm gonna give a drug to Troy, and I'm not gonna give a drug to Mufo, and I'm gonna see what happens. Okay, Troy turns green and grows another arm, and Mufo is fine, okay, experiment. That's an experiment, right? It's different than ethnography, so it's a different, a different approach. And then finally, research methods. So research methods are like, how am I gonna collect the data? I'm going to use interviews. So you could say, my philosophical worldview is maybe participatory or social construction. I'm taking an ethnographic approach and my data collection methods are interviews and participant observation. So many people just start with the methods. My research is interviews. My research is questionnaires. My research is statistics. Well, that doesn't mean anything to me. I wanna know what's your bigger approach? What's your philosophical worldview? How did you decide about that? Why did you decide about that? And you have to explain and justify your, your decisions. So this is research design. Research design is this architecture. It's like building a building. If you're gonna build a building and you don't have understanding of the plan, the structure of the building, the materials you're gonna use, then your building will fall down and your building will um, not last very long. So that's why we call research design um, like an architecture. But research design is a bit different than just research methodology because it includes these three, th three interlocking things. Okay, does anyone have any questions so far? Including Troy? No? Okay. Okay, great. Um, okay, so research design. Um, a couple of quotes that people say, they say, uh, research design is a structure that gives the execution of research method and the analysis of data, that, uh, it gives structure to the execution of research and the analysis of data. So research design is more than just implementing a project. It's this beautiful thing about how you design it. Where does it come from? And I love research design. I think it's probably my favorite part of research is designing a project because you can really think about how all the elements fit together, including things like budgets, boring stuff. How is it gonna be implemented, the logistics? 
Um, it's about also project management. How will this project be managed? Um, what's the life cycle of it? So that's why research design is not the same as research methods. Um, and there's many, many different um, types of research design that differ according to your discipline. So mathematics and physics take a very, very different approach to research and research design than the social sciences or anthropology. Um, and there's a lot of arguments. Sometimes people get into fist fights because they don't agree with each other's research design. Um, someone from chemistry or medicine may insist on an objective world that we can measure through observations and they're going to defend their results. An anthropologist may say, no, it's all constructed. Your world is just beliefs and um, it's constructed by us. So even your medicine is just a social construct. And the, of course, the medical scientists will be very angry. They'll say, but we created a vaccine that saved your life. How could there not be uh, objective, valid research? You know, there's a lot of conflicts between different research designs. So that's why some of you may be more familiar with uh, physical sciences or um, so sociology, which is very much influenced by physical sciences. And I'm giving you a little bit more of the anthropology, human geography view, which is not the number one, it's not the only view. There's many, many, many different types of research design. So you need to realize that the information I'm giving you is based on my discipline. It's not universal. Okay, so, um, sorry. So I want to now turn to this philosophical question. Um, <clears throat> it's a big question, and it's something that many um, metaphysical philosophers think about. Um, and unfortunately, we don't always have a lot of time to think about it in academia, but it's the question of what is reality? What is, what is this thing that we're doing? What is this world of, made of? How do we, then the second question is, how do we come to know that world, right? And that's these big philosophical questions. So the first question that, um, it is, it, that I want to talk about is one on ontology, which asks, what is reality? This spot of that schedule, is that an accurate translation, Luca? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Ontology, though, is a word that emerges from a particular culture. Do you guys know the origins of the word ontology? There are some linguistics here, so you must know. Ontology? Okay, go ahead. Ontology comes from the Greek, from the Greeks, okay, from ancient philosophers. Ontology is basically rooted in Greek, a Greek word. So this idea came from ancient philosophers from the West, the Greeks. It's not a Persian word. It's not a Mongolian word. It's a Greek word. So isn't that kind of strange that the Greeks have influenced our research methodology and approach so much? I'm sure there's many philosophers from, you know, 13, the 13th century in Mongolia who had their own ideas about what is, what is the world made of. Or how about the Islamic philosophers, some fantastic philosophers from Persia and that era. But we aren't using their word today. We're using the Greek word. So that's also interesting, right? Um, and so the Greeks were started to be interested in this questioning um, what is reality? I'm sure as many other philosophers have, but the way that research developed and the choices that um, were made probably in the Middle Ages and then the, um, the 18th, 17th century, they tended to refer back to the Greeks because Western culture likes the Greeks. They didn't want, can you imagine, uh, you know, very Christian Europe choosing an Islamic philosopher as the basis of their research design? It's not going to happen. They're fighting, they were fighting um, the, uh, the East for too many years. So they rejected, the, rejected those, those ideas. So ontology comes from the, comes from the Greek philosophers. It's, um, it comprises many different theories which seek to answer the question about what the world must be for knowledge to be possible. So how do you guys interpret that? What does this mean to you? Any ideas? It asks the question, what the world must be like for knowledge to be possible?
Any reflections? Yes, go for it. Speak loudly. This, it must be a, a good clear up so it Okay, say again, it must be analytically observative. observative. Okay, like, um, so we need to. Uh, so we need to take those objective instances, at least. But uh, we cannot say that uh, the sun rises from the east. Okay. It is uh, 180 turnaround. But we cannot say that the sun, uh, sun rises from the west. Effectively, more, but we can at least say mm. uh, objectively to say some sound of us more on the one piece. Okay, okay, good. Excellent. So, what you're getting at is that from observation for many, many years, we observed that this pattern the sun is rising from the east. So, we think, okay, reality must be this, but we don't know. Tomorrow, the sun could rise from the west, right? We just assume that this is reality. We assume that you know, all of the stuff around us is real. Maybe I'm in a dream right now. I could be in a dream and all of you could just be a figment of my imagination. How do I know that this is real, right? Um, or maybe many people have, uh, many people believe in religions where, um, you know, I'm a spiritual person myself. I pray, okay, I hope that today goes well and I don't mess up when I teach, you know, I'm praying. Um, who am I praying to? Some kind of God. How do we know that God exists? I mean, I'm not trying to answer that question, but I'm just saying, what is reality? Does it consist of these things that we can't observe, maybe? I mean, gravity exists. If I drop the papers, it will fall to the ground, we assume. So there's many things we don't see that exist that are part of our reality. There's many things that we also do see that we think is part of our reality, but how do we know? That's like a very deep philosophical question. I can't answer it for you. It's just a question that makes us reflect on everything, how we come to be. And from that, we can ask, how do we come to know something? So ontology is coming from this uh, metaphysical philosophy, and there's many philosophers who contemplate these things, you know. There's many, many books about metaphysics. What is the world? What does it consist of? How do we know that we know what we know? <laughs> and so those are the very important questions with research, research design. So ontology, they ask, what does reality consist of? Is reality only stuff that I can see and touch and feel? Okay, I, I, I can feel this paper, this must be reality. But then there's so many things I can't see and I can't feel, I can't hear. Does that mean they don't exist or do they exist? So those are some questions. What does reality consist of? What is the nature of the world? Um, you know, it's again, thinking about beyond just material things. Do social entities exist independently of our perceptions of them? To what extent are our perceptions influencing reality? Is social reality independent of us? So there's that funny phrase, if a tree falls in a forest and doesn't make, and you can't hear it, does it exist or something? Is that the point? Is sure. So it's kind of getting at that, that idea. How do we know that things happen even if we don't see or hear them? So these are ontological questions. Why are ontological questions important? Because if we don't ask the ontological question of what is reality, then we can never think about how do we know something? How do we know something if we don't even understand reality? Right? It's this really deep, frustrating question. Many of my students get really annoyed at me. Stop talking. We don't care. Tell us how to do research. <laughs> okay. So epistemology is the next idea, which is, okay, so we thought about reality. Maybe we only think reality is stuff that we can touch and feel and observe. Okay, if that's the case, then what counts as valid knowledge? That means it's only stuff that we can touch and see and feel. That's the only thing that counts as valid knowledge. I can see the paper, the paper exists, therefore I can know it. I can know this. So if we don't accept that idea that maybe we believe that there's things that exist that we can't see, can't touch or feel, then we take a different approach to knowing something. How do we come to know something? What types of knowledge are valid and true? What is truth? How do we you know, gain truth? It's actually a really good point, this thing around the sun rising in the east. We've accepted that as a truth and a fact, but 
there's always a possibility that things could change. Maybe a, you know, maybe something happens in our solar system and suddenly we don't realize it, but the planet switches, you know, it pivots, and now the sun is rising from a different direction. I don't know. It's a possibility. There's a very, very minute possibility um, that it may exist. So here's an example of epistemology. It's kind of what I was just getting at. Um, there's uh, two different ideas. This is related to the way we might understand the environment. Um, so some people in uh, the sciences or, or in academia believe that humans can observe the world and measure it. In my mind, what I think exists separately from the world. So that's the B. There's me and I'm looking at the world and I can observe it, I can measure it, and that's how I know the world, is through that process. And another idea is A, which is that human knowledge is produced through immersion in the world. I'm in the middle of everything, and I'm producing knowledge about this world. So that means we learn through language and culture, and knowledge cannot be separated from social processes. I can never be objective. I can never be outside of my world. I'm always inside my world. So therefore, knowledge is never truly objective. These are two different approaches, two different approaches to epistemology, and both are accepted. Some scientists believe that we can exist in an objective way outside of our world, and others say, no way, that's not possible. That's why we have so many fist fights, people fighting each other. What are you talking about? Ah! Um, so this is the example of epistemology. Um, so I want you guys to think about that more as the week goes by. So we have these huge metaphysical questions about what is reality, what is knowledge, where does knowledge come from, how do we come to know something, and then we have a lot of different theories that try to answer those questions. And those are kind of more referred to as different research paradigms or research theories. So this theory says that you know, we can understand the world through doing this, blah, blah, blah. This theory says blah, blah, blah. And people follow different the theoretical approaches or theoretical paradigms. And that can guide us in how we're gonna think about that problem. So maybe there, um, if I'm a feminist geographer, um, I, don't, I'm not, I don't really identify as a feminist geographer, but I'm just using that as an example. Um, then I will use a specific idea of the world an idea about knowledge to drive my inquiry. I will ask specific questions based on that theoretical approach. Or maybe I'm a post-structuralist. Um, Troy, give me a post-structuralist name. Uh, Your best friend. Derrida. Oh, oh, yeah, okay, Derrida towards you. Okay, good. So there's a bunch of philosophers from France who were the post-structuralists. I'm sure the, the linguist, linguistics know about these guys. Um, and uh, so, so they really, really were very, very critical of um, how we come to know something. Um, and I, I kind of like the post-structuralists. It's like Foucault and Derrida, those guys. Um, yeah, yeah. And um, uh, that he, they said, okay, there's actually no stable truth in the world in terms of our belief. Like, 500 years ago, we believed some things were evil and some things were good, and now we believe the opposite. The evil things are good now, and the good things are evil now. What's, what's with that? That's weird. So that means that, that nothing is stable. There's a, oh, things are always changing. So the post-structuralist has that belief. So if we believe that, then we will use that to drive our inquiry, use that to drive our research questions. Um, if we believe that there is always a stable truth, then we use that to drive our inquiry. So we have many different types of paradigms. So here's an example of a different par a paradigm. So the paradigm, we have um, these different paradigms, positivist, post-positivist, constructivist, critical theory. These are just very, very basic, very, very, very basic approaches. And if you really want to start, you know, going to do a PhD publishing in English, you really need to be familiar with these things and you should re read a lot on your own. So positivist believes that there is a single objective reality that can be observed through science. How many people believe that? It's okay if you maybe you don't know right now. Okay. That's one idea. That's one that's one approach. Approach. 
post-positivists, they say there's a single objective reality, yes, but scientific observations involve error, so reality can only be known imperfectly. That's a different approach. Okay, then there's a constructivist. They say there's multiple subjective realities, of which each of which is socially constructed by and between individuals. So a constructivist and a positivist are not agreeing with each other. They don't like each other. They're not agreeing. It's a totally different way of looking at things. And then we have critical theory, which say, okay, there are multiple subjective realities influenced by power relations in society, reality shaped by social, political, cultural, economic, ethnic, and gender values. So that's another paradigm. Okay, I'm going to take a drink. So um, think about a question for a second. Okay, so um, that's, these are ontological assumptions, and we have epistemological assumptions. So that's about reality. What is reality? How, what does reality consist of? And then the epistemological assumptions are about how do we know or come to understand that reality? So according to the positivists, we can gain neutral knowledge through the use of reliable, um, and valid measurement tools. Like, I'm going to observe what the frog is doing, and therefore I can know the frog. Right? Because I'm observing, I'm measuring, I can know what the frog is doing. Plus, positive says obtaining knowledge is subject to human error. Therefore, human knowledge is imperfect, and only probable truth can be established. So we can always say it, it might be wrong. It might be wrong, but we can establish some kind of truth. The constructivist says knowledge is subjective and formed at an individual level. So all my ideas and policies, yeah, okay, it's there, it's a thing, but it's influenced by my own beliefs or the time I was born or whatever it is. And critical theory says knowledge is also subjective, but created and negotiating between individuals and groups. So they're interested in the power dynamics involved in, in knowledge creation. So those are the two examples of ontological assumptions, epistemological assumptions, how they drive our research inquiry. So here's another um, kind of graphic that I thought would be useful, um, where they bring in actually a question of what do we value? So um, what we value is also, according to these authors, is also an important thing that shapes our understandings of reality, you know, knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. Go for it. I think you had a question. Do you have a question? For, for post structuralists Okay, that's a really good question. So post structuralists are more in critical theory. They're part of critical theory, yeah. Um, but that's a good critical theory has many different they have post structuralists, Marxists, feminists are all in critical theory. Um, but structuralism, which is sort of like the pre there are people like um, Claude Levi Strauss, those anthropologists, they're more in the um, maybe like post positivist structuralists. They still believe that we can gain some kind of um, some kind of stable objective knowledge. But that's a great question. Okay, so this is the kind of flow chart. <laughs> what do we value? What's out there to know? How can we know about it? How can we then acquire that knowledge? What procedures do we use to um, acquire it? What data can we collect? So many people start with the final stage. What data do we need? What data do we need? But I want you to back up and think about these other questions when we think about research design. Everyone goes straight to the data. I need 100 questionnaire results. But why? Where did all that come from? There's all these bigger, bigger issues. Um, and you can look at this on your own when you have more time. I think it's kind of a useful tool. Okay, so, um, sorry, let's see. So we have the research paradox. Um, so we have many, many different theoretical perspectives. I've just mentioned a few of them, and I can't get into teaching these at all. <laughs> we can't talk about this during the, the, during the summer school because we don't have enough time. And this is like each one would be their own semester of classes. So we have positivism and spatial science, which is great. Buho is coming from a more spatial science. Professor Buho comes from a more spatial science perspective. So you'll get spatial science um, tomorrow. Um, we have humanism and phenomenology, Marxist theory, more than human theory. That's a really new kind of theory in geography. Post-colonialism, 
postmodernism, non-representational theory. We have many, many, many different theories. And you should kind of read a lot and try to decide where, what's the theory that I'm most interested in. And I can't tell you that everyone has their own interests in different theories. Um, and they have their own approach. Okay, so now I just want to mention a couple of um, a couple of kind of important things that are happening amongst in, in, in my school of geography at least. There's a lot of discussion around um, the Western influence on the way we do research and how we think about research. Um, and so there's a huge movement to decolonize research, um, to really question the dominance of Western academics, Western theories. For example, why do we have like five French philosophers who dominate most theory? I think Troy has a slide tomorrow. Foucault is one of the most cited persons in the world in terms of academic research. Why is that? Isn't that weird? Why do we have a French philosopher from the 1960s and 70s dominating all of our ideas? There must be other ideas out there that are really interesting. So the question is, how did that come to be? Um, first, like I mentioned, we have the influence of Greek philosophy, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, but we could have had Islamic philosophers or Mongolian philosophers or Indian philosophers. There's many, many types of philosophy out there. Why do we have this Western influence? Um, so many now critique the dominance of this Western ideas and theory on the way we think, how we do research, how we collect data, the whole thing. So many SOAS students, um, well, this is an interesting article from the UK. Uh, our SOAS students write to decolonize their minds from Western philosophers. So many students say, we don't care about Foucault. We don't care about uh, Aristotle. We want to hear about the work of other um, philosophers who have not gotten any attention for the last, you know, 800 years. And, and here in Mongolia, you may also think, how to decolonize the Soviet and Russian thinking and approaches to science and research. Yeah, exactly. So where does this, this stuff really influences how we think, but uh, students are demanding that things change and that they change fast. So we have to, for example, the last two years in School of Geography, we totally rewrote our curriculums. Okay, we need to find people who, um, we need to start engaging with different ideas outside of just these mainstream uh, European um, philosophers. And uh, there's a lot of great work out there. But like in academia, it depends on, if someone is cited a lot, then they gain prominence. And there's many thinkers who are not cited a lot, and so they haven't been gaining pro prominence. So we're trying to bring those people into the mainstream. And there's a lot of indigenous um, scholars from Canada and the US who are also making a big movement to um, reject Western philosophers because they see that as a form of violence. They call it epistemological violence. Now you guys know the word epistemology, epistemology, epistemological, that means anything related to knowledge. So they say it's a form of epistemological violence, the fact that all these Western philosophers are dominating our, our thinking. So they go beyond just saying it's influence, it's actually a violent act to um, dominate the way we think. So here's some interesting examples from the colonial period. Um, you know, science, like I said, had a history to it. There's an amazing history of science that I hope you read about um, on your own, because I can't teach the whole thing. But in the um, 16th century, you know, there are a lot of European explorers going around the world um, for their economic purposes and to, you know, learn about what the world is about, find trade routes. And science really developed a lot during that colonial period. And it was dominated by a lot of the um, Spanish and, uh, you know, British European powers. So what they started to do is, the European powers, they started to uh, collect all this stuff from the colonies. Um, and they started to arrange that stuff according to what they thought were logical, you know, arrangements. So they would say, okay, um, here's some stuff all related to fishing. I'm gonna put all this stuff in one group and I'm gonna call that, you know, the world's stuff on fishing. And then they started to write about this. Oh, this is what fishing is in the world. And then people said, oh, okay, this is what fishing must be because those people wrote about it and they collected all these objects and that becomes the basis of our knowledge. So 
actually, there's a really interesting, um, they call them cabinets of curiosity. And many, many very wealthy colonial um, elites would collect this stuff and they would invite their friends over and they'd say, hey, look in my, look in my cabinet with all this stuff I have from South America and India and et cetera. And look, I've arranged, I've, I have a whole um, advisor to help me arrange these things. And so this is how we could know about the world through these cabinets of curiosity. These are actually the first museums. The museum came out of this cabinet of curiosity. Um, and many wealthy elite um, people from the colonial period, they donated their collections to the museums. So the British Museum, the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, the basis of that museum is from these collections. So a museum is all about knowledge too, right? This is you know, knowledge of this part of the world. It's coming from these spatial arrangements. And they're called theaters of wisdom. And so here's another example um, from the Enlightenment period. During that period, there was a lot of work ordering and classifying and creating typologies of things. Like, okay, these are all different sort of, you know, rocks or crystals, and they're all kind of taking similar shapes, so we're gonna classify them in this particular way. So the Enlightenment um, scientists started classifying things, and they assumed, okay, the whole world is governed by these universal laws. And so we can take this approach and we can apply it to social sciences. And that's why social science is so, in, is so influenced by the physical sciences, sciences. And we can question why do we have this influence? And actually it's coming from the colonial period. But let's say this rock came from like, let's say Peru, and the Peruvians may have a totally different way of understanding this, this rock. This rock means this thing to our culture. It has these properties, et cetera, et cetera. So we aren't following the Peruvian system of knowledge about rocks. We're following the enlightenment period classification of rocks. That's the same for mammals, you know, plants, et cetera. Why do we have those classification systems? Because they're embedded in these past processes which were dominated by colonial powers. So our knowledge that we have come to accept is a legacy of these histories. Science is a, science was created and has a history. It doesn't just exist um, independently of us, if that makes sense. So, okay, so then there's a, tons, of, tons of more work saying, all right, we need, to, um, we need to move beyond those Western paradigms, those Western philosophies. And so we see the epistemology of resistance. How do we resist those ways of classifying things? How do we resist those ways of, um, not, of knowing? How do we even resist this institutional context where we have to publish, publish, publish? Um, how do we move beyond? How do we change things? And so we have lots and lots of books. For example, the Rappledge Handbook of Epistemic Injustice. That means people who maybe their ideas have been, you know, um, put down or they're told that they, they don't have the right to think or say anything because it should only be men who write publications. For example, like in Oxford, I don't think a woman graduated with a degree until like the 1940s or 50s or even 60s. So for many years, um, many feminists say that's an, epistem an epistemic injustice. The fact that women have been excluded from knowledge production for almost the entire existence of humanity except for the last you know, 50 years or something. They say that's an epistemic injustice. All those people have been left out. So that's just an example, you know, you could, we can have other examples as well. Um, so, okay, so that's the, that's the main um, kind of issues I wanted to discuss. So I have an exercise for you now for the next like half an hour, just to get you thinking about how do we interpret um, reality. Um, and hopefully it'll be like a fun little, fun little thing. And um, it's based on this article that I found a couple years ago. Um, and I find it can be quite interesting to, to do this. So this article talked about, it's kind of talking more about, um, it's coming from the theory or paradigm called phenomenology, which I'm not gonna talk about now, um, but I thought the exercise itself was useful. So this article is saying that, you know, there's many different ways that we come to know the world. And they use this example of this snail. Um, and they say, okay, this snail, we can look at it from the um, 
from direct observation in this cognitive do domain, that's what they call it. And we say, okay, we can directly observe things like this snail has um, a hard shell and antenna. We can see, we can see stuff and we can write down the things that we see. But we also know some stuff about the snail. Some people do. Maybe you guys don't know too much about snails. I'm not sure. I know, okay, if I put a snail in a desert, it's going to die. But I don't know that just by looking at it. I know that based on my past education. So we can say, I have some understanding, which is indirect observations based on my knowledge. And then I have an effective do domain. Effective means um, tied to your emotions, effective. So I say, okay, I look at this thing and I say, oh, wow, um, this is really cute. Or I, that's like totally disgusting. We have some emotional reaction. And then also we have um, an indirect observation based on our cultural understanding. Okay, it symbolizes some something. It symbolizes very slow moving, you know, oh, the day is going like a snail, so slow. Ariel's lecture is like a snail's pace, so slow, boring, make it in. Um, and then some people say, oh, I look at that, it's so delicious food, you know. I want to eat that thing, whatever. Um, and then other people have other ideas. So I want you guys to do this for a picture, but I have to... I have to put the picture on my screen, so you need to give me a minute. Um, and so what I want you to do is work with your ta on your table. I, 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 Troy already gave you the sheet of paper, and I want you to do this exercise for the picture that I'm going to give you, and then we, then you can discuss it, okay? So that's the idea. So just take a break for like two minutes while I find the picture. Yes, sir. Okay. The most influential Mongolian epistemology. Yes. Oh, I think I need your help here. Oh, I... <laughs> Let's see. So it's basically based on Mongolian concepts and philosophy? That's a very good question. I, I think that probably a lot of Mongolian epistemology has not influenced many Western scholars because we don't have many words or concepts like that over the years. Western scholars have used. For example, maybe there's a word similar to ontology, but it's not, there aren't many philosophical concepts that are used. People say that, that why is the reason? People say it's an epistemic injustice. The domination of Soviet culture, for example, destroyed uh, the Buddhist philosophy that existed in the 19th century. Some people might say that the Soviets destroyed that you know, way of understanding through violence. Um, so we might say it's an, it's an epistemic injustice. For example, if we were to say like, there's Mongolian concepts and philosophies that exist, but they aren't used as theoretical um, paradigms, but they could be, you guys could do this. This is your job, right? You can say, hey, there's a concept within um, Mongolian shamanism, maybe, and I want to use that as my philosophical point of view. My, my st student from Iran is doing that. He's using, using Persian philosophy instead of Western philosophy. And he's saying, I'm using this Persian philosophy deliberately because this is more useful for what I need to understand and what I need to know. And he explains and discusses these problems around the dominance of Western philosophy and theory. And he says, okay, we already have these ways of doing things. Now I'm going to do use this way of doing things. But he explains and contextualizes it. If the cognitive domain. And I think that's very interesting. Why is that? Why does that happen? Um, maybe it's just uh, in the UK, the students are more interested in immediately doing some analysis before observation. Um, so this is kind of relationship between um, you know, observations and then how do we interpret or analyze. So, okay, I'll just leave it there. I think it's interesting. Keep reflecting um, and hopefully as time moves on, things will become more and more clear. And if there's stuff you didn't understand from my talk, then please just ask me directly and I can clarify. So, you Thank you.